Good evening. Thank you for um, coming to our TIC night tonight. Paul Klinginger um, from the, uh, is a program administrator from the um, UMass Lab of Medical Zoology. And he's the one that, um, if we have any problems, I always call him and bug him about, um, you know, we're having TIC testing problems. But um, he's wonderful. And he's coming tonight to help us um, understand what's trending in our ticks and what's trending um, in, uh, in general towards, um, really, I would say it's the first epidemic of climate change. Um, I, I old enough to know when I had my kids, I never, you know, I've lived in the same house for 40 years and um, I had four wild kids that were outside all the time, never, never pulled a tick off of one of my kids or any of our dogs. Um, now my grandchildren, same house, same yard. We have to do tick checks constantly. They go across the yard, we got potential ticks. Dogs, um, you know, we had Great Danes and you know, they're all over the place. Never had a tick. My, my daughter's Rhodesian Ridgebacks that have the same kind of no hair, you know, uh, hairless kind of dog. Um, we're, we're pulling off ticks Every, you know, you go out in the woods, you have, to, you have to pull ticks off all the time. It's really terrible. Um, and, and some of the, what's happening is, is you don't realize that um, the ticks, 50 feet away, they can, they can smell a breath and they're ready for potentially to, to, to have you brush by them and get on you. Um, and I think what's so awful for all of us is that it's so misdiagnosed, um, Lyme disease and some of these other bacterial infections are so misdiagnosed. And especially as we get older, um, we have the potential of misdiagnosis and you know thinking it's old age rather than really what it could be. So um, there's cycles. Uh, when we have a huge acorn uh, crop, we have more mice, and that's your vector. Um, Paul is going to go into some of this stuff, but mice is a, they're the vector that carry the ticks that have more likely have Lyme disease than say uh, a deer. De one in 10 deer might have Lyme disease or, or be the potential for Lyme disease, whereas mice is, is just con is re reverse of that. It's like nine out of 10 mice. Um, can carry Lyme disease. So you have more chipmunks, you have more mice, you have more squirrels in your yard, and we have a high um, acorn crop that year, we're gonna have a bad tick year the next year. So um, you have, to, we have to learn about this. It's, a, it's, it just is. So we have to advocate for ourselves. We have to recognize um, what we're doing and, and the town is supportive of working with UMass. Um, we have uh, established the Pioneer Valley Mosquito District, and once we get this really up and running and established, we're going to file legislation with our um, senator, Joe Cumberford, and make it be like a bug district, because we have to deal with ticks and mosquitoes. And so, and we're gonna, to be sustainable and affordable for all of us in the Pioneer Valley, we need to be working with our UMass lab. So. We're hoping the relationship that we started with the tick testing will um, morph into mosquito testing and the whole kind of shemang so we can handle everything. But in the meantime, I would like to turn this over to Paul who is truly the expert um, and will be uh, able to tell us about what's happening. All right, thank you very much and thank you for, for coming in. Uh, if you do have any trouble hearing me, just give a wave. Uh, so I, I'm the program administrator. This is sort of a, a new position as the, as the lab, the Laboratory of Medical Zoology uh, that's on the UMass campus. As the sort of communication part of the lab has really expanded, uh, we found the need to have actually more, more people on hand to communicate what, what, is, what is this PCR testing what is a what? What does pathogen mean? Uh, what's DNA? What's RNA? And so we have uh, the lab was founded by our director Stephen Rich and the associate director Dr. Guang Shu, and they are the researchers. Between the two of them, they have uh, a bit over sixty years working with ticks and with uh, in microbiology, and. Um, 
they, in 2006, they founded this lab that did something for the first time. For, for decades, people have studied ticks. Uh, and what they do is they take a piece of cloth on a stick and they go out in the woods and they walk around. And they brush that, that flag over bushes and in tall grass. And then at the end of 50 yards or 100 yards or 1,000 yards, they stop and they take some tweezers and they pull all the ticks off of that flag. And so it's a great way to, to collect ticks. We do it ourselves in the fall, mostly because we are looking for a population of ticks that we use in the lab. And it's possible in some places in the state, especially a, a field technician who used to work with us, he was sort of a magician with this, and you can go and you can find 1,200 ticks in an hour. And you can pick them up, you can take them back to the lab. And that is a great way to find ticks. One of the, one of the potential drawbacks and the reason that we took a, a different approach is that you can find 1,200 ticks from here over uh, to the, the senior center here, and you will know very well what sort of ticks are between this point and that point, and you can know what they're carrying. But if we go over to the, the lumber yard here, that's not between me and that station, and so we miss out on some of that. So the approach was, rather than active surveillance, as it's called, going out and flagging, we do passive surveillance, which means that we ask for people who have encountered a tick on themselves, on a family member, on, a, uh, on one of the, a pet or, or other animal, uh, to send those in for testing. This get, gets us a much larger distribution. We have gotten ticks from all 50 states and about 22 other countries. And it lets us know everywhere in the state far more than we could ever do with a single technician not only what are, what's the overall distribution of diseases, but it also narrows in on ticks that actually are biting humans. Because it may be that the ticks between here and the senior center would never encounter a human being if we're out in the woods where we're traditionally collecting. So it was, it was something new. It's something that has really picked up quite a bit in the last three or four years. And we're, we're glad to see that. It's sort of a, a paradigm shift in the way that this research is done. And um, we, we think that it's really adding a lot of valuable information to, uh, to understanding of ticks. Since 2006, we have done, we've tested, I believe, about 63,000 ticks now. Um, last year, we did uh, about 13,500. So far this year, we've done over 12,000. So I believe we're probably on track to do about 14,000 this year. And what's really important is that we'll probably do 14,000 this year. Last year, we did between 13 and 14,000. The previous year, we did 13,000. So not only are we getting a lot of ticks, but we're getting a lot of ticks over time. And so we're able to say, this is the infection this year. This was the infection last year. This was the infection the year before that. And we're able to show not only what is the problem right now, what is the snapshot, but what is the, the longer timeline here. So today I wanna talk briefly through three sorts of areas. What can we do about ticks as, as individuals? When can we do it? And when I say when, uh, it's sort of a daily thing, but we're also going to look at the calendar a little bit. And then, why should we do it? Uh, most of you will probably know generally that there are some problems that can be caused by ticks, but uh, we can get into a little bit more detail there. So when we're talking about behaviors, uh, and we talk about personal protection, some of these are not going to necessarily be the most mind-blowing. Uh, activities in the world, but one of the emphases that we have in the lab is really just uh, we teach tick safety like sunscreen. It's not very interesting, but you do it every day, and those good habits, rather than sort of a, a magical fix-all silver bullet, are what really bring results in the long run. So for yourself, you showering is actually uh, a really nice method because it's a great time to do a tick check. 
You get to uh, check parts that are not always visible uh, when, when you're out in the woods. And if you can do this, this every day or, or nearly every day, um, make the time to do this tick check. If you can keep a tick on you for no longer than a day, you've done an awful lot in, in mitigating the risk of tick-borne disease. So uh, checking and also showering, just there's always a chance that you're going to dislodge a, a tick uh, in, the, in the act of showering. Um, so again, something that, that's kind of a part of life. If you think about that as an opportunity while you're, while you're at it, to check very carefully for ticks, that's good. And I'll look in just a moment, what are some of the, the most common places you should look? Clothes dryers, you may have heard about sticking clothes in the dryer. It is kind of a, something that we think about with a lot of bugs, uh, a lot of arthropods. Uh, ticks are, are not bugs, but um, what, what really kills ticks in the real world especially deer ticks, is going to be desiccation. It's going to be getting, uh, getting dried out. So they want very humid spaces. That's why a lot of ticks, their sort of main habitat, especially between feeding, is going to be in the leaf litter. They get a little uh, sort of microclimate. It's a little terrarium. The humidity is very high. That's, that's great for them. Clothes dryers, uh, you're really looking to, to dry them out. Um, and that's a, a good way to, to kill ticks. So a lot of uh, people will suggest when you come in from a hike or walking the dog or gardening, stick your clothes in the dryer for a few minutes, then put them in the washer um, so that you have the heat killing them before washing them out. Light colored clothing you'll hear a lot about, not necessarily because uh, ticks are, have a preference for light colored or dark colored clothing, but ticks are generally dark little things, and it's a lot easier to spot it on this than it is on a pair of dark jeans. So if you have, if a, a tick has to crawl its way up your leg, um, you're gonna have just a longer time that you have the chance to happen to glance down, see it uh, set out against light pants, that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna help you make sure that you get it off of yourself. And when we're, when we're thinking about clothing, it's useful to know that ticks are always going to climb against gravity. So this is consistent enough that this is actually how repellency tests work. If you have something you want to know if it will repel ticks, whether it's DEET or something like permethrin, or if you have uh, a, a geranium oil or a cinnamon oil and you want to know if that'll work, the, the way that these are tested is you hang a tissue paper on the wall, you put a line right at the, at the, uh, the 50 yard line, you put a line of your uh, repellent right across the middle, and you put ticks on the bottom. They are hardwired to go to climb against gravity until they fi find a good spot to attach to a host. If they don't climb and if they don't uh, cross that line consistently, you have uh, a strong suggestion that there's something about that that they don't like. So you can use that sort of knowledge that they are always going to go up when you are thinking about how to protect yourself. It can be a bold fashion statement, but uh, you can tuck your pants into your socks because they will, ticks will come up, they'll be on your shoe, they'll get on your sock, and then they'll, they'll be on the outside of your pants rather than going up the inside. They're not going to uh, get to the top of the sock and try to go over under, um, at least very typically. And so if you have that, you have made sure that they're going to skip your legs, they're going to go up your pants. If you uh, tuck your shirt in, you're m making their trip even longer. And again, more time for you to notice or more time for you just as you're walking around to brush them off. Um, so thinking about that element of tick behavior, they always want to go up. If you can make that trip longer and be more vigilant, great. And again, just checking yourself every single day. And where you want to check yourself. Uh, this is something that we put together in 2014 when we had 
50,000 fewer ticks. Uh, but this really hasn't changed, so we haven't bothered to change the graphic. When we are looking at ticks, the vast majority, um, at least if you're, you're looking for a single hotspot, is going to be the upper legs. Ticks are frequently, adults are gonna be questing probably somewhere between 18 and 30 inches off the ground, just sitting there waiting for something to come by. They've got little hooks on their front pair of legs. They're gonna wait for something to brush by. So that's what, where they will first get onto you. They may try to climb up uh, or they may try to attach immediately. Um, you know, if they get if they uh, get onto you at your knee and you're wearing shorts or something and they can find a good spot, they may stay there. But th most, most, especially adult ticks, will start their journey uh, in the upper leg. The other two areas, and this is most important when we are finding engorged ticks sent in, they're probably going to be the middle of the back or up in the hair. And this is one of those things where it's hard enough for me to reach my back um, because I'm not no. doing yoga. Um, <laughs> but I am especially not going to notice, this. I'm not going to see it. So it's uh, an easier place for ticks to get attached and to stay for a couple of days, increasing the danger that they're, um, that they're gonna be on long enough where if they are infected, they may transmit something. The other part is just in the hair, nice cover there. Um, it's really useful uh, both for yourself and especially for children if you can do just sort of kind of like a little scalp massage just very carefully run your fingers up the scalp looking uh, feeling for bumps and if you can just sort of check almost like you're doing a, a lice check on a child if if I'm paging through so every tick that comes in we take micrographs of it really high quality, high def pictures under the microscope. And if you order a tick report, you'll get a, a souvenir micrograph of your little friend there. And when I'm paging through the week's micrographs, if I see a badly engorged tick, I, there's a decent chance if I go and look at the host, de, uh, the host information, it was probably on possibly a pet, but very likely a child. So children and in the hair. It's a really popular spot. And you know, for young children, it's hard to keep them still. They also may not like haircuts, so they may have a lot of hair. Uh, once they get slightly older, it's a little bit harder to get in that good habit of checking out uh, children very carefully. So that's just a, a good They're also good about point 20, 20. 20, 30 inches off the ground, too. I mean, you're talking yep. about adults and their they're, thighs. That's about where the heads are of the kids. They're, they're very good targets. The tick doesn't have to go nearly as far. Yep. And so you, we want to be checking these areas so that you can get them, get the ticks removed while they're still the size of the life-size pictures you have on this card. You want to get them off before they start to look like this. Okay. So these are uh, both Exodes ticks. Or, um, so they, in this area, they are deer ticks. This is the nymphal stage, sort of the teenager, uh, that's gonna be most active in June and July in this area. And then this is the adult tick that's gonna have two peak periods. And so the nymphs are gonna want to be on for maybe four or five days. An adult is, depending on the tick species, is gonna be want to uh, be feeding for more like seven to maybe as much as 10 days. Um, and the, uh, we, we think about attachment time, it is sort of a curve, okay? It, it's a distribution of, of risk there. And we think that the peak of that, that curve where uh, it really starts to be very likely that, um, that transmission could happen really starts at 24 hours. So that's sort of the shoulder of a bell. Um, 24 to 48, 48 hours, that's gonna be that peak time. Um, there may be other variations, and that, that's also generally for bacteria. There are some viruses, including Powassan virus, that it is thought 
they could be transmitted in as little as 15 minutes. Powassan is extremely rare uh, in, I believe that we have tested 30 or 40,000 ticks for it, and we have found 18 positives. So it's very rare, and almost all of the positive results that we have found were on Cape Cod. So it, it is something where, uh, as, as you were mentioning, with mice, what mice in a certain area are carrying really, depend, really uh, determines what the ticks are going to be carrying. And it doesn't seem that out here in western Massachusetts that the mice are carrying uh, Powassan virus and a number of other things. Okay. So we're, we want to have uh, good habits of checking for ticks. We know that uh, they'll, they'll be in hard to reach places. We know that they will like places where there's sort of cover. Could be in hair, could be in uh, places where the skin is a little bit uh, thinner, especially where uh, it's rubbing. That could mean an armpit. That could mean between your legs. Um, those are all good places to check. And they're also places that you aren't necessarily spending a lot of time staring at every day. And so that's it sort of increases the chance that a tick might uh, get attached there. So try to, it may be a, a humbling experience as it is for me, but just tr spend some time looking very carefully, uh, you know, checking your shoulder blades, checking under the arms, uh, any other place that a tick might hide. Okay, so if you do find a tick, um, there are, there's a lot of information about removal. So, um, if you, if you ask the internet, you could remove a tick with nail polish, or rubbing alcohol, or paint thinner, or a lit match. Don't, don't use a lit match. Um, and, or Vaseline. And the idea with a number of these things like, uh, or the logic with a paint thinner or Vaseline, is that you're somehow going to seal the tick in. It's going to suffocate. It's going to release. It's going to come off. Um, I'm not sure that there's really any sort of data to back that up. Um, a lit match, if, you, if there's an alternative to sort of burning something that's very, very close to you and a very difficult target to hit, let's just try to avoid that on principle. <laughs> you will hear um, also on the internet that you should absolutely not do any of those things because they're going to cause the tick to regurgitate. Um, we don't think any of those are a good idea. We're also not really sure that all of those are going to cause those problems, that putting Vaseline on a tick is going to make it more likely to uh, inject pathogens. Doing that or squeezing the tick, this, this is not a turkey baster, and so it's not a matter that you squeeze it or you put something in contact with it and it injects everything back in. Um, it's it's not a good idea. Really what we look at is if you are putting on nail polish or Vaseline and waiting for a tick to detach itself, the tick is going to be on longer. Right. We want to take the, the most direct route. We want to remove them mechanically. There are a number of uh, very fine tweezers uh, on the market that are, that are good, and I'll have these up here if anybody wants to look at them afterwards. They have very sharp points. This model in particular has extremely sharp points. At another talk, I was gesturing. I sort of stabbed myself <laughs> in the hand. Um, but the idea is that this is something where, rather than coming like this and pulling outward, ideally, you're going to come in from the side, and you're going to lift it off this way. And uh, to show that, my props are chopsticks. <laughs> And the way that we want to remove this, if we have a tick that is attached, only this little portion will ever go under the skin. But it does have barbs on it, like a fish hook, that make it difficult to pull it out. And some species of ticks may secrete a cement here that also attaches them that, uh, to your skin. So you have that. And you want to come in with your very fine points of tweezers from the side. Grab as close to the base as possible. If you can grab any of that brown of the, the mouth parts, great. 
and just slowly but steadily pull up. And it may be something that you take a few seconds and you kind of release bar by bar, but let it, uh, let it work its way out. You don't want to twist. Uh, some, uh, there's also information on, on the internet that, that this portion is a corkscrew and that the, the tick actually twists itself into you. That is not correct. It does have those barbs, but it is, uh, but we really just want to pull it straight out. There is a lot of questions. Sometimes this part breaks off and it remains under the skin. Um, this is something where I'm, I'm not sure that there's a lot of clear uh, absolute information knocking it out, but really if you take off the main body, you have taken off the salivary glands. So you, the chances that there would be bacteria and enough bacteria to cause disease in those parts is probably pretty low. We have, if we've taken the main body of the tick off, we have uh, taken off the mechanism that circulates the contents of the tick back into you, okay? And anecdotally, uh, because I, my job is spent answering questions and uh, following up with, with people who find a tick, I do know that some of the worst infections that I've heard of were with people who went to the doctor and the doctor used a scalpel to try to uh, dig out these very small parts. Ticks make a small wound. Scalpel makes a much larger wound. We know that open wounds can get infected. So our, our advice is usually that you're probably better off if that does break off, let it go. It'll work its way out like a splinter. Um, try to get the, the body off intact. Again, it is not a, a turkey baster. So we don't think that you're likely to squeeze pathogens into you, but if you squeeze it, there is the possibility that the body could break. And if the body breaks, its contents come out on top of an open wound. That's, that's not uh, a great outcome for you. So if it does break off, and really any time you remove a tick, if you can just uh, clean the area with alcohol immediately after, that'll be great. So once you have the tick off, uh, we, there's all sorts of things with flushing the tick or, uh, or throwing it away. We really do encourage people to save that tick. Uh, you can put it in a, just a zip top plastic bag. That's more than enough to contain them, even if it is still alive. And we recommend you put on the date, who it was attached to, where it was attached, and maybe how long you think it was attached or anything else that was significant. So I, if I found one um, on me, you know, I would say uh, September 30th, left elbow, no rash, or, uh, or maybe if I had been camping over the weekend, I'd say uh, I might have been in, uh, in a certain state park. So I, if, if there's a chance it came from somewhere else, you have that information. Keep that tick, and if uh, ways down the line you start having a flu or flu symptoms that you can't quite explain, it doesn't seem to be acting the way that a normal flu was, then you can uh, send it to our lab for testing and see if that tick may have uh, presented a, uh, any uh, risk of transmitting disease. One thing, if you are thinking of holding on to a tick, Keep it away from bleach or less frequently formaldehyde. Both of those can actually damage the DNA and make it so that we can't test the tick. Um, if you have a tick that's alive and that's just, that will not do to have a, a tick that is in your, your house, as I said, it cannot get out of that plastic bag. It doesn't have teeth or claws that will, that will get it through that. But if you put it in the freezer for a few hours, that will kill it. If you need that tick to be expired right now, you can submerge it in alcohol. And that will, uh, that will kill the tick, but not, uh, not have any effect on the, the testing. Alcohol is actually used at a few stages of the testing in our lab, okay? And then the when is an important part. So we have uh, arrivals of ticks in our lab starting at the, the end of March here, 
uh, and going through January. And we see that there are these two seasonal peaks here. The two orange or, or tan or brown peaks are happening, they start right around tax day, as I remember it, and then the adults will be active uh, through about mid-June in this area. You'll find adults throughout the year, but that's gonna be the peak season. They're gonna be emerging and looking for a host. Several, maybe four to six weeks afterwards, uh, in late May, early June, we see this blue activity, and those are the nymphs coming out. Again, those are the, the teenagers. If you're looking at your, your card, it's gonna be the third column from the, from the left. So those are ticks that have fed on one host uh, as a larva. They dropped off, they molted, and they emerged as nymphs. Both nymphs and adults, since they have fed on a host, may have the potential to carry a pathogen. Um, adults have fed on two different hosts, so they may have a higher uh, chance of having an infection. You'll often hear that nymphs are more dangerous, and one of the main reasons there is that they're much smaller. And so it's much more likely that that nymph will be on you for one to three days before it starts to expand and you notice uh, it. And so that will increase the risk that, again, if, if that tick is infected, that it could have transmitted what it has to you. Okay. When our lab is talking about uh, assessing the, the risk of tick-borne disease, there are kind of three things that, that we want to think about. What is the tick species? How long was it attached? And then is, the, is this particular tick that you encountered infected? Okay. Um, because different t species of ticks will be able, capable, actually physically capable of carrying different pathogens. Um, and we'll look in a moment at things that deer ticks can carry, but dogs, dog ticks can't and vice versa. But we want to know how this infection process happens. Larval ticks, effectively 100% of ticks when they uh, hatch from eggs are, are not infected. There is, there is one pathogen that is thought that in s some cases it could, uh, it could be transmitted from the, the adult female to the egg. Uh, that, that disease is not Lyme disease, so uh, it is a different sort of bacteria. So again, I said effectively 100% of larval ticks are going to be uh, uninfected. Their first meal is usually going to be with some sort of rodent. Uh, so it could be a white-footed mouse or, or chipmunks, uh, other, other small mammals. They will feed, they will try to feed for several days, and then they will drop off and molt into nymphs. These small mammals are the primary reservoir that keeps that bacteria going uh, year after year and make sure that ticks always have a, a place where they can go and along with their, their blood meal, pick up uh, some of these pathogens. And then they'll, they'll feed there, they'll turn into nymphs, they'll move slightly up the chain, they may still feed on rodents or they may move to a slightly larger mammal, a, a possum, raccoon, cat, dog or person or deer certainly um, but we think more more with the if they find mice again that that's going to be a higher risk of them uh, picking up a pathogen and then they'll turn into adults and they will ideally be looking for uh, a larger host and by this point with deer ticks approximately 50 percent in massachusetts are infected uh, dog ticks, lone star ticks, that number is much, 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 much lower. But uh, they will get to this point as adults, and adult females will try to uh, feed for, again, about a week, because they are trying to uh, create, kind of store up enough fuel to create potentially a few thousand eggs. So they have a big, big job ahead of them. They need a lot of energy for that. With male ticks, generally, if they attach, it will only be for a very brief time because males, 
do not need to survive past uh, fertilization. So uh, they may be able to go through their entire reproductive process without feeding at all. Again, it is possible they may attach a, a, for a short time, but that curve, uh, that, that time that they attach is not going to be anywhere near the one to two days where the, the risk of transmission becomes very high. So when we are looking at ticks, we do want to know, is it male or female? And we have them divided here. The farthest, farthest left is the adult female. The next one over is the adult male. So again, if you find uh, a male tick, that is likely to be uh, a little bit less of a risk because, not because it, of whether or not it is infected, it could be just as likely as a female to be infected, but the chances of it uh, feeding long enough to pass it on to you is quite low. Borrelia burgdorferi is the uh, bacteria that causes Lyme disease uh, in humans. Deer ticks in this area are essentially the only carriers of it. So if you find a dog tick, or Dermacenter variabilis, or uh, a Lone Star tick, Amblyoma americanum. Uh, those, those can carry certain pathogens, but they are not going to be a, a risk of Lyme disease. What we're looking at instead there are some of the, the other tick-borne diseases that are out there. Sometimes you'll hear them called co-infections. We try to avoid the, the term co-infections because it sort of seems to imply that these are things that could be a plus one to Lyme. Uh, and it's very possible to get to find any of these without Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, so we really just use the term tick-borne diseases overall. But uh, really, overall, deer ticks in this area are going to be the worst by far. They're going to carry the widest range of pathogens and at the highest rates. Uh, dog ticks and lone star ticks are going to carry some very different uh, bacteria, but are, uh, in general, going to have very low infection rates. So. Again, we want to know what the species is, how long has it been feeding, and then what is, what's the actual infection status of that tick. Finding the actual infection status means sending it to our lab, um, doing, doing very complicated uh, work to it. If we see that it is a dog tick, and it's a male dog tick, we already know that the chances of, of contracting uh, a, a disease from that have already gone very low compared to an adult female deer tick. So it's something that we um, we just emphasize sort of appropriate caution. Uh, we never really want to to try to to stoke fear, and uh, we want to kind of emphasize that there are times that that um, the the risk will be higher and times that it will be lower. This is a list, I'm sure you can't read all these from out there. If I was in the front row, I couldn't. It's more to make a point. It's better that you not read it. These are uh, all of the, most of the pathogens in North America that, it, that ticks carry or, are, or it's suggested that they carry. Uh, so we do test up to uh, 23 different pathogens uh, depending, on, depending on the package. We have a, a couple levels of testing. This is something I'm happy to talk about later. But what is really important there is that we have really worked very hard so that all of the, all of the results you're likely to get are gonna be covered and most accessible in the, the lower levels. Uh, some of these are extremely, extremely rare. Uh, something like uh, Babesia, Babesia duncani. It does exist in the world. It is carried by ticks. If you weren't in recently in Western Washington or parts of coastal British Columbia, your risk has has gone down quite a bit. So this is something where, again, as part of my job, as part of this expanded role at the the lab, it's helping people to 
to figure that out. Uh, you know, what, what should I test for? What could this tick possibly be carrying? And I would ask you, all right, uh, can you send in a picture? We can figure out what sort of tick it is. And where have you been recently? Um, being in the West Coast or being in Indiana, those generally are gonna have much lower infection rates. Western Mass is arguably slightly lower infection rates than Cape, God, Cape Cod, um, but still, still high enough that we wanna be very cautious. Okay. Uh, another point, and this is, um, there are a number of labs emerging that are doing, for-profit labs that are doing uh, tick testing now, and something that you will see is this SPP. So you'll see um, Babesia SPP tests, or Rickettsia SPP, or Bartonella. And what that means is it goes to this, this whole group of Borrelia, and it there could be uh, dozens or even, even a couple hundred strains, individual species of each of these, and they just sort of cast a net and said, is there any Borrelia in the sample? We do uh, Borrelia uh, sort of broadly cast net testing because the vast majority of Borrelia strains are pathogenic to humans. So we find that that is, that is useful Something like rickettsia is much, much more common. Few, uh, fewer of them are pathogenic to humans. There, there are a number of rickettsia strains that are, that are very harmful, but there are some that are more benign and they can be found in all sorts of places. So if you get a positive there, which we would expect in quite a number of cases, just because this rickettsia is everywhere, we're just not sure what you've learned and we're not sure if that's something you should learn about or be worried about. So we will, we will uh, check instead specifically for Rickettsia rickettsii or um, you know, any, any of the, the strains that, that we know actually are found in ticks and can make it through their salivary glands uh, and, and that are found in a certain area, okay? So this is just something to think about when you're reading results, when you're reading news stories, that there's, there are results and there are different tests that you can do to get a, a, a sort of effect. And something that we try very hard to do is to uh, focus in on things that are actually causing harm rather than an answer that we don't fully understand, okay? So we, I mentioned the lab was started in 2006. It really started out as more of a local uh, operation. It uh, really worked in co cooperation with UMass Extension. And we we're looking to answer some questions uh, in Massachusetts. And we did some field work uh, on Cape Cod and on the islands. And this really uh, supported that. Largely a, a local New England concern. This is a map of all of the unique zip codes that have, from the lower 48, again, we've received ticks from all 50 states plus about 22 other countries. And this, this shows you kind of how, how broad our reach is um, and the, the places that, fortunately, these are all places where there's a lot of tick activity, so we really feel that we're doing a lot of good. And, um, so th this is a database where, again, we're, we'll probably get 14 or 15,000 this year and getting the same results over time. And so we're able to show those changes uh, really across the entire country rather than just in our own backyard. And that's something that we have found, even if that wasn't the original plan, very important and something that I think has really set us apart. But. We, we do have a, a special connection with, with Massachusetts. And so it's always useful to, to see what are we getting around here. So just from 2017 and 18, this is the distribution. Uh, the vast majority are gonna be deer ticks. That's partly because deer ticks are, are very common, 
but also partly because uh, people know, especially if they talk with us, that deer ticks are going to present uh, generally a much higher risk than a dog tick or a lone star tick. So we see that we get uh, over 4,000 per year. I think we've already surpassed 4,000 in 2019. So there's the number of ticks that we get, and this is what we find in those ticks. So overall, uh, right around 37% are going to be of, uh, uh, of ticks are going to be infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. Right around 6% are going to have anaplasma, which causes anaplasmosis. Somewhere around 8% Babesia, which causes Babesiosis. And then there's a, um, a lesser known, sort of very distant cousin of Borrelia burgdorferi, which is Borrelia miyamotoi. And what we find, if we, if we went farther back or if we did the calculations for 2019, is this, is this is good news. A lot of these infection rates are actually very stable. So whether, uh, whether there's more awareness, whether there's more testing, the actual percentages of those ticks that, that we find are carrying something doesn't seem to be changing dramatically. It tends to be just sort of a, a fluctuation uh, from year to year of, of a percent or so. And how serious are these pathogens? Um, all of these can, can be pretty serious. You know, this, this is the most famous, causing Lyme disease. Um, but, but all can, can be pretty serious. All of them are really going to start with, uh, with sort of flu-like symptoms. So fever, joint aches, and can progress to, um, to, to various other other problems and that's something that sort of diverges and this is something that kind of goes beyond our expertise on the medical side we really focus on the the ticks what they're carrying how they behave once any one of these bacteria or or this uh, this parasite in the case of babesia hits a human immune system things get very very complicated and it's much harder to generalize and so you'll, you're, you're probably aware that there's a lot of debate uh, over treatment of tick-borne diseases and a debate over how high the concern is. It's not something that we can necessarily comment on very much. We do know that these certainly have the potential to, to cause very, very serious illness. But it also seems that, that some people um, are going to be completely uh, without symptoms. But th these are the most common, and, uh, and some, some of the more serious. Powassan virus is also very serious. It has the potential to be fatal, though there has been work uh, done by MassDPH that has shown that probably a, a strong minority of people actually uh, show symptoms. So it's like a number of other viral infections. A lot of people will get the virus in them, and their body will fight it off, and it won't really be a problem at all. Um, again, once, once any of these pathogens hit a human immune system, it's very, very difficult to predict what will happen, and really individual mileage will, will vary, which is, um, which is not, not necessarily a very satisfying uh, announcement to make. But, um, but these, are, these are the most common. These are good to, to look out for. Um, and, and worth just kind of keeping on your radar, again, in sort of the, the sunscreen level of, of concern, uh, but being very careful to uh, do tick checks so that these really are not, um, not an issue. What disease yeah. does the Borrelia miyamotoi cause? Uh, that, is, that is an infection that is just associated with Borrelia miyamotoi. So some of them, you know, it's, they're not very creative names. It's um, the blank, blank, blank virus. Yeah. Um, so yes, I would, uh, that is sort of a, a perfect time to come in. Are there questions that you have about ticks or the pathogens they carry? A lot of dog places have all kinds of scoops and gizmos to pull ticks off. Are they as effective as Scotch tape? 
Um, we, ha we have a slight bias against scotch tape because when it comes to the lab, the well, that, it is very common. It's just difficult for testing because getting a fairly fragile little tick off of tape so that we can test it is a, is a bit of a pain. There are a number of products, and this is not to endorse or, or diss any particular products. There are a number that use sort of a, a claw hammer principle. So the idea here is that we have this little teardrop shape. You're going to put the big part over a tick, and then you're going to pull down. And this little sort of wedge-shaped uh, gap here is just going to pull it off. And this works very well, especially for adult dog ticks. The problem is that when you get to deer ticks, and especially younger deer ticks, that gap can be a little bit big. And so it may take multiple passes, or you may not be able to, to catch the, the tick, especially depending on, on where it is. So th these are one solution, but really we always just kind of go back to tweezers, whether it's an adult or a nymph or a larva. Tweezers are great. If they have a nice sharp point, they, the point kind of adapts to whatever you're pulling off. Um, you know, when, when we're looking at things like that, there, there are some products that, I would just look at a twisting motion uh, as something that I personally would not endorse because again, the, the tick does not attach itself through twisting. There is perhaps, perhaps the increased chance that you're gonna break, break off the mouth parts. Again, that may not increase your risk significantly, but even if, it, even if it is completely fine, if it takes two or three days, you're gonna have this sort of reminder and it's just gonna bother you. So we, we recommend tweezers. If there's something else that you've had good luck with, um, as long, as long, don't use the burn match. Don't try to, to scare it off with nail polish, but if it's working for you and it's getting the tick off quickly, I think that works for us. Uh, and there are sometimes, especially with larval ticks, because if, if you're having a bad day, it is possible to have a hundred of them on you because they will be, uh, they'll be laid in a, an egg mass that could be a thousand, could be two thousand, and they will all hatch and they'll be in you know, a square yard or so. And they're gonna be waiting for mice to pass through that square yard so that they can hitch a ride. If you or your dog happens to pass through that square yard, it is possible that you could make a, a number of new friends uh, without meaning to. But the, the other thing there is that they could be in this square yard and I could roll around in the grass right here and not have any trouble because they hatched over there and they are not necessarily going to travel very far uh, without a host to carry them. Uh, so in those cases, there sometimes the best people do is kind of do the, the DIY lint roller, duct tape around the hand, and just pull them off. Um, if, if that's what it takes to remove them, again, getting them off first, uh, getting them off soon, is usually going to be our, our guiding principle. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think those uh, sharp forceps are generally available other than through laboratory supply houses. Uh, do you know of any place? Uh... They're, um, they're, they're probably getting slightly easier to find. Uh, both of these are commercial products. Um, one, this is, again, informational rather than an endorsement. This is called TickEase, T-I-C-K-E-A-S-E, -E, um, and it is distributed by someone in Massachusetts. Uh, and I believe, I don't hold me to this, but I believe that they may even have been picked up by uh, a number of CVS locations. Uh, I know that they're, they're working hard to get that distribution out. Uh, these come from uh, actually a dermatologist in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who is a good friend of the, the lab um, and has uh, actually arranged this year for free tick testing for all Oklahoma residents through our lab. Uh, so he's a, a huge advocate for, for figuring out what is in Oklahoma. 
uh, is there Lyme disease? Is it, uh, is it sort of locally sourced or is it all coming from somewhere else? And I know that these are available in uh, kits that are uh, marketed towards school nurses. And if you just searched test my tick there, it would take you there. So yes, they can be a little bit limited and some, of, some tweezers that I've seen that are parts of tick kits are not necessarily tweezers that I would choose. Um, but but they, are, they, they are becoming slightly more available. Do you have to, how does a tick get on you? Do you have to actually brush against where a tick is hiding or do they propel themselves in some way? Nope, they, they are, in fact, there's a, if you'll uh, look, bear with me for an animation here. This really shows, oh, tell you what. Nobody needs PowerPoint. Computer's not appreciating me right now. Uh, really what they're going to do, it's, it's always possible that you could catch a, a tick not, not truly deliberately questing, and it may just kind of take the opportunity to, to grab onto you. But generally, when they decide that it's time for them to pick up a meal, they are going to go and uh, climb onto a bush or tall grass, and again, probably somewhere between 18 and 30 inches off the ground for adults, and they're going to sit there. They've got little hooks. This is what they do. They just sort of wave their arms, and they wait for things to, to pass by. So they are not... So uh, they actually brush against what they're standing on. Yeah, so they're not going to chase people. They're not going to jump out of trees. Uh, deer ticks uh, don't have eyes, so that would be a poor plan for them to try to uh, geronimo onto people. Uh, and, and that is something, it is commonly thought that they will jump out of trees, but uh, that again is that climbing, it, climbing against gravity. So they can end up in your hair quite easily, but it's because they found you somewhere else and moved up. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Are the population of ticks increasing? That is, that is one of those questions that's a little bit difficult to answer. It is, it is possible, even likely. We don't have hard measurements going back very far. Um, you know, there, there does, anecdotally, I think we, we hear all the time that 40 years ago, we never had these ticks. We weren't encountering ticks. And uh, you know that that is definitely true. Certainly, the number of ticks that are encountering people does seem to be increasing significantly, and that's probably due to a number number of issues. Uh, you know, cl uh, climate change will be playing a role. Uh, we know that warming temperatures has allowed ticks to expand their habitat, uh, eliminating predators, especially uh, things like foxes has allowed the mouse population to come up and everything is connected, That'll, that supports the, the tick population. Uh, things that we have done, actually they're very beneficial, reclaiming farmland and planting trees has increased some habitat for ticks and, and the other uh, creatures that they rely on. So um, yes, it, it's certainly likely that that tick populations are increasing, but even more than that, what we can say is that interactions with people are increasing. So at the very least, ticks and people are cr crossing paths more. With your, dis your testing distribution map, what? Are there fewer t ticks in the flyover country, or are we just bigger on sending stuff in for testing? There. There, there's a couple of things happening there. If we looked at a population map of the U.S., we would see that an awful lot of that does overlap. Um, and especially the, the ticks that are most, that are the biggest concern, deer ticks and their relatives, tend to be on the coasts. So on the east coast, we'll have Exodes scapularis, the deer tick. On the west coast, we'll have Exodes pacificus, a very close cousin that 
um, in terms of its capabilities of uh, transmitting pathogens, very similar. Um, though there are different infection rates in the mice there. So the, the infection rates with ticks is very different as well. It looked to be a concentration like where Colorado probably is. Yeah, there, well, there's, there's different things happening. There are some ticks that are found in the Rockies, especially at very high altitudes. Um, and uh, most of those will never cross paths with people or won't cross paths with very many people. So, you know, there's just a whole lot more people. There's more people who have heard of us. There's different types of ticks. Um, and especially in some of the kind of the Southwest in more desert areas, there you're not gonna see anywhere near the, the same populations of ticks. So there, there's a number of things happening, um, but the easiest thing to look at there is really, that's gonna match a lot of the distribution of Exodes ticks, so deer ticks or very close relatives, which present the greatest risk overall. Where do our ticks in our area sequester over the winter cold months? Uh, they will um, really any leaf litter that's available. Okay. They'll just again they'll get into these little kind of insulated spaces, um, and they will they will overwinter while they're most of them are going to be working on developing eggs during that time. Um, do you have uh, uh, protective measures that you think are uh, really effective? Um, maybe you yeah. talk about that for a second. Yeah, yeah. You know, again, we uh, we don't emphasize silver bullets because we would with anything. Uh, it's not our first thing that we talked about because we don't want people to be complacent on the behavioral side. But the two main uh, s substances that we would recommend are DEET. Uh, which is great because it repels both ticks and mosquitoes and has overall uh, a good, good uh, safety history. It is effective. We know that it works and it's kind of the benchmark against which all other repellents are, are uh, used. That is a repellent only. So it doesn't, doesn't really harm the tick. It's just something the tick's not going to like and so it's going to turn away from. The other big product is permethrin which is an acaricide, it will kill the ticks, and that is something that um, you, you're not gonna apply to your skin the way you would with DEET. Generally, it, um, mammals are very bad at absorbing it through the skin, so the, the risk is not necessarily very great, but it's just not a, not a great idea. Um, but the nice thing about that product is you can spray it on your clothing and on your shoes. And in clothing, it generally will last about seven washes, seven to 10 washes. There's some kind of heavier duty uh, commercial products that you send your clothes away to and they can come back or you can buy special products that are supposed to be rated for more like 40 or 50 washes. But that is the, the acaricide uh, that again is killing the ticks. DEET is trying to keep them far enough away so that you aren't even going to kill them. Um, the only thing I want to mention to people on, on permethrin is that um, cats, it's toxic to cats. So if you have cats, you probably shouldn't, you, you just need to be careful. If you, if you spray your legs, I have a bottle of um, Bronco um, horse spray because it's very, you know, it's inexpensive. It's six ninety nine for a big bottle that will last you most of the summer, and it has permethrin in it, as well as some of your, um, you know, bug spray for mosquitoes. But if you spray your legs as you go out, your pants and your <laughs> shoes, not your legs, um, you know, you it, you it really keeps them away. It's amazing. Um, my husband, when he does wood out in the, you know, goes and cuts wood in the um, woods. Um, you know, he, he'll have dead ticks on his pants, which is just amazing. Instead of being loaded when he camp comes back, he's actually killing him as he's going out there. And um, you can use it on, like the Bronco spray, you can use it on your horses, but you can also use it on your dogs. But if you, again, if you have a dog that licks a lot, you want to make sure you at least rub down the dog after you've gone outside, just so that, you know, you don't have... Um, the, the any kind of um, possibility of the dog, dog in, in, ingesting it. I, 
as far as I know, there hasn't been any issues with it other than being that you need to be careful with cats. But um, I think that's one of the most effective. And um, I, But I had a question because you can get the concentrate on the internet and then you know you mix it with water, a more diluted solution, and you can spray in your yard. But um, it's not clear how often you should spray your barrier. Um, would you do one barrier every couple of months, or is it like six months? I, I, there's different times I have seen on the internet, and I'm not really sure who to believe. Right, and that that's something that honestly isn't it at the core of our work, partly because, and this is not based on our own inform, uh, on actually field testing it, there, there could be questions on how long it lasts. Um, you know, so if you spray on Wednesday and it rains on Thursday or Friday, we don't know the exact amount that it gets, that it, that uh, it would basically be deactivated. Um, a, a good resource there is actually uh, Cape Cod, Cape Cod Cooperative Extension, and I'm sure you you know or remember Larry Dapsis, yes. who's the county entomologist there. He has uh, he has actually a, a very good website that puts together some of that, and he has some recommendations on products, on how to spray, where to spray, how often to spray. That's good. I I want to say offhand, and I really really do need to confirm this. I think that. I think that he says anywhere between three and six weeks, uh, depending on oh, three to six de weeks, okay. depending on climate. But um, but yeah, that's that's a good place to check there and just just to see the other resources he has. Uh, they've got several layers on again looking at DEET and permethrin for yourself, products for your yard, but even even more than a spray outside, thinking about how to manage uh, manage terrain. Um, you know, a nice sunny mowed lawn is not going to be a preferred uh, spot for deer ticks. Something like dog ticks, they won't be quite as bothered. Um, but if you have kind of uh, nice cleared areas that you that you're in when you're grilling, or when you're just kind of uh, having coffee in the yard, that's nice. And then you have other areas if you're cutting wood or um, if you're able to sort of segment things off where there's kind of the, the, the wild area, wilder area of the yard, and those are places where you know if you enter that, you're gonna do a tick check afterwards. Um, so thinking, certainly you can explore sprays, but thinking about denying habitat to both ticks and mice very close to your house is at least as effective. Um, and yeah, sort of a thing that you can do with landscaping uh, instead of applicating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Carolyn, to your, to your point, I think the amount of rainfall, because there's water solubility with all these these products, that's why they're safe to humans for the most part. Um, so if you have lots of water that rain, you have a problem you have to spray. Yeah, there was, there was some discussion on the cure rate, like if you sprayed and you didn't have rain for three or four days, then it was going to stay for X number of weeks. But if it, you'd sprayed and then you, and it rained, then it, totally. chances are it never really dried out, and then so it's just going to wash away. Right. And so it's just, uh, you have to figure out what, what is going to work and not going to work. And a lot of those products are also um, frequently going to be sprayed by a, a professional sp uh, treatment service, and they may use slightly different products, so it's good to check specifically with them what is that product, if you can get a, a, a data sheet on it, that, that may vary as well. That, so that, that's kind of another reason that we don't really know what people are, are using, so it's hard to, hard to generalize. Mm -hmm. I, I had forgotten about that Cape Cod Extension website, yep. and um, so we'll and track it down and put it on our yeah uh, with a, uh, yep. about ten videos on all all sorts of things about tick behavior, uh, tick prevention, and you know a good resource if you're curious. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Is there any other questions? Yeah, uh, cost wasn't mentioned. I know the towns have had. 
a deal with mm -hmm. the lab in the past. Uh, We're continuing that. Yep. Um, actually, um, I just asked Paul because um, we did run into a problem. We were switching from um, the CDC grant to our town subsidized, um, what we appropriated at town meeting. There was a, a gap in the billing. So we've sorted that out. Um, and we're right now using um, Mass DPH um, grant to um, do the testing. So it's still subsidized. And then we still have um, money that we appropriated at town meeting that will hopefully fill the gap in the spring. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it doesn't matter. Um, Paul will call me and, um, and I'll make sure that we have um, the availability to have subsidized um, testing. Instead of the 150 or $200 test, it's the $15 that will pop up mm -hmm. on the tick testing if you're a Deerfield resident, it's $15. And it is so worth it. Um, number one, the reason why I feel it's justified for the town is because we do want to know what's happening here in Deerfield. And we have been very stable in our, um, the disease, Lyme disease. But what has been happening is we started out at only 2% and now we're closer to 10% on these other um, infections. And they are just as bad or worse than Lyme disease. And, and because they're not as known as Lyme disease, doctors aren't, um, you know, really paying attention to them as much, your primary care. And so the reason I think it's so important that if you have a tick that you pull off, you send it right down to UMass because it's so important to get treatment within the first, you know, within a week. It's like you're, you know, they talk about the golden hour, why we have ambulance. Our ambulance is so wonderful because they respond in like seven minutes now and you can be in the hospital within that golden hour. Well, this is the same thing. The golden week after you've been bitten, you want to have your tick tested because the, the tests for Lyme disease and stuff are just not reliable. And, and they, sometimes they come back positive, sometimes they come back negative. They don't really give you the true um, reading on your body. Whereas if you test the tick and it's been on you and, and it comes back positive, you can take that paper to the doctor, your primary care, and say, you know, I want to make sure that I have treatment for this and, um, and this is why. Whereas, you know, someone will say, oh, well, when you're feeling sick, come back. And, 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 and you might not have symptoms for a while. And then it's like you're, you're trying to play catch up. And, and, and there's all kinds of debates on the, you know, antibiotics. And, I, and I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to get into that. But if, if you if you doctor suggests that you get one big, massive dose of antibiotics, go find another doctor. I'm just saying that it doesn't make sense. That big dose will knock down your symptoms, but it doesn't eliminate what is circulating in your body, whatever the disease is. And so you need, you need to advocate for yourself. And this is one of the most important parts of taking care of that, you know, and getting that tick test information is so that you can advocate for yourself. There's just too many people. I've just, as Board of Health here in town for 16 years, I, or 17 years, I, I'm just hearing these awful stories. It's a reportable disease to, um, to the D Mass Department of Public Health. And so we get the readout of how many people in town are infected with stuff. And it, and it, and it is so discouraging to have people be so sick. And, and, and what is really so worrisome for me is our kids, because the age group, you have little kids that are you know, rolling around in the grass and stuff, and so you have to be vigilant. But as parents, you're handling your little kids. What happens is in the, the and uh, Paul will probably, I would hope, um, would have some statistics on this maybe, but the, the group that has the biggest growth for infections is, you know, your eight to 12 year olds. You know, they're becoming independent, they can dress themselves, they want to take care of themselves, and they're certainly responsible. But honestly, they're not being able to do tick checks correctly or well. And, and, and just, you know, they're not getting their heads in their hair um, in the middle of their back, and that kind of stuff as well as, as, as we would hope. So that has the highest growth 
of, of disease in our town or in, and in this state. And that's what really bothers me. We, we are our poor kids. It'll have a huge impact on kids. But, but coming back to Mike's question about cost. Um, it's $15. The, it's apart, 15 Apart from the grants, so how much yeah. is the town roughly? So, well, we pay 15. We, 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 we do have three, we have three levels of testing. One is standard DNA, which will be the most common seven to nine pathogens, depending on the uh, species of tick. So tick comes in and we say, is this a deer tick or is it not a deer tick? And then it goes into different testing cues and it's going to be tested for different things. Um, it, that is the, the basic level. We have another level that adds RNA testing, which is adds seven viruses. Most of them not very common. Powassan is most relevant here. We have a third level that does every single test that we have, regardless of tick species. Those three levels, if you are not a Massachusetts resident right now, are fifty, one hundred, and two hundred dollars. Um, and so, right now, the Mass DPH grant brings the one hundred dollar level which is the seven to nine DNA pathogens plus the seven virus pathogens, $100 down to 15. But big picture, Carolyn, for the townspeople, how much in the town meeting did you kind of set well, aside? Well, we've, we've been setting aside $2,500. That's it? Yes. For the whole town? Yes, for the whole town. To take care of the healthy town. Right, and we've been lucky. We've either had a CDC grant um, or the DPH grant and um, Usually we hear from the CDC um, at the end of the fiscal year. But I, I didn't hear anything this year, so maybe there isn't any money. So, but so usually we get something. So, the, so what happens is people send in their ticks, and if we run out of the grant money, then the town money come, hit, uh, kicks in. So that there's supposed to be seamless, and we just had one little mess up this past year, but we did. It has seamlessly switched over to town funding for the two cycles. So it's really important to get the two cycles: the fall, right now, until we, you know, get winter, but, but my, and the spring. My feedback would be: you've done a fantastic job at very low cost to the oh, yeah. population and the residents of Deerfield, and so kudos to you. Oh, well, I, like I said, I, it, the ticks and the mosquitoes are, are, are just, you know, um, part of climate change and part of the new reality, and we have to protect ourselves. And the most way, best way to protect ourselves is self-awareness so, and, and being positive and proactive about trying to protect yourself and, and advocating for yourself with your health care giver with the information from UMass. And so for that $15 that you pay, um, you know, and, and the $15 that the town pays or, or that we get grants for is, is, is a lifesaver for people um, because these diseases are devastating, um, especially for kids because kids are growing and it interrupts, um, you know, um, one of my grand, granddaughter's ki uh, friends was all summer was spent you know, they were mis she was misdiagnosed. She didn't even know she had a tick bite, and she was sick all summer. And I mean, it's just a horrendous thing to happen. Um, so we we need to be proactive as a community. It's it's public information. It's me bugging Paul to come out and just give you a little bit of information. And um, but it it is it is wonderful that the town is supportive of this because I think it's one of the most useful things that we can do. Um, and, and like I said, if you have a tick and you, you send it in and you hit the tick report, if, if you don't, if you can't do it, come into our office and we'll help you make sure it happens. Um, or at least a white, our public health nurse can help you submit it, send it in, get it tested. They, they're really good. Um, I've had several ticks tested over the years. And one of, one of the times we didn't have money and it was 200 bucks and it was like, and then I, my husband got one, and it was like we had three ticks tested at 200 bucks one one summer, and I was like, oh man, that's terrible. But um, we've been using um, pemethrin, and um, actually we haven't had any ticks. So I've had no tick bites for the last couple of years, which is just amazing. Um, so if you're aware and you're proactive, 
But if you get a tick, send it in. And, and UMass is wonderful. They, ha they, ha they send you back the information within 48 hours, usually, 24 sometimes. They're very good. And you can hand deliver it if Currently you're- Currently we're, we're at about uh, 23 hours. Yeah. <laughs> this part of the season. Now, I will say in, uh, in late May, early June, when in the biggest weeks we've received 1,300 samples, not, not, not 23, 25 hours, but we absolutely guarantee that it will be back in, to you in three business days after we receive it. Um, and it is, we have a, a full-time staff, both the office and downstairs of, of uh, eight, eight uh, full-time staff plus, plus the faculty. So um, yeah, we have the ability to do, have some long weeks. Most of us were working about 60 hours a week during May and June, but um, we're able to, we've had some practice and figured out how we, how we can make that more efficient and, and keep that volume up, so. Yeah, it really makes a difference. So if, you, if anyone gets bitten, please use our tick, tick report. And um, it's on our webpage. You can go to tick report and it will pop up um, if you don't want to go through our web page and um, it's really worth it. It really is and just take care of yourself Make sure you they call a number here at the office. If yes, if people if people need help they can get help in our office or um, Our public health nurse when she's in um, Because not everyone has is access to the computer, but we can send it in for you if you um, don't have access for computer uh, You can go to the library and use the library's computers um, it, or deliver it. I mean, some people are so worried that they get they do deliver to their back door. We, so. we do have uh, a public facing office, and we probably probably have as high as a thousand people a year who walk in. Um, probably seven hundred of those have a tick. Another couple hundred just have a question, um, or sometimes they have something they think might be a tick, and we'll take a look at it and let them know uh, before you go through the order process. Um, so that, that is an option as well. So thank you very much. Um, thanks for coming. And um, if anybody has any questions, um, I'll make sure we pass them on to Paul. And, um, and thank you, Paul. I really appreciate you working with us. And it's um, been, I don't know, a few years now since we've been working together, and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you again for having me and for coming out. I'm, I'll be here uh, packing up. Feel free, if you have any questions, just to come on up. Thank you. Thank you.